Hey everybody, this is Mrs. Robinson. Hold on just a second. Alright, so um, this is actually part two, so if you haven't watched part one, go watch it. Um, part one analyzes Benjamin Banneker's letter to Thomas Jefferson. And this is going to be an analysis essay. I wrote three quarters, 80% of an analysis essay, and then down here, look at me, oh yeah, that last body paragraph, nope, because I have to go get some stuff done around my house, but I showed you the majority of it. Um, if you really want me to write that last body paragraph, I can <laughs> write it for you and make another video, um, but we're making do with what we've got today. So I'm going to start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. I'm using what is called revision history. Um, if you ever want to see the revisions that you've made to a Google Doc, this is a great way to do it. Um, so here we go. I'm trying to show you in as real time as possible what I did. So I started off here at the beginning by describing um, the author of the article. We already did an analysis on it. So I'm just giving some of the information that was provided by the article itself. And I'm, gener I'm giving like seriously less than a sentence right here. Wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson in an attempt to convince him to join the fight against slavery. Less than a sentence of information about what the text actually says. That's why I start my intro. Um, I That is the way that I advocate starting an analysis essay. A little bit of background information about the author and his or her um, qualifications, and then like a sentence to address the rest. That half a sentence to address the rest. The next sentence should be a slightly more detailed summary. So I added that. Somewhere you can see I've crossed out and rewritten. Um, so I said, let's go to this. See, so revision history is great, though, because if you wrote a previous version that was better, it's a good way to see what you have. And we're just going to wait for my computer. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Okay. So here I have, uh, the son of former slaves and accomplished mathematician, farmer, and author, Benjamin Banneker, wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson paralleling America's struggle against Great Britain and slave struggle for freedom. So I added a slightly more detailed, like, summary. Banneker's purpose. So the second sentence should be what the author's purpose is in writing the piece. Banneker's purpose is to convince Jefferson to join the fight against slavery. So if you go through your rhetorical triangle, author's purpose should be covered there. And then the last sentence, which is like your claim, these two sentences together are really your claim, the purpose and the tone. Um, Banneker employs a tone that is both, both respectful and insistent. So you cover the tone and then one specific thing that the author uses the tone to appeal to. And I said to appeal to Jefferson's desire for respect and penchant. Penchant means something that you tend to do, penchant for intellectual discourse. Um, because Jefferson is known as being an intellectual. So this is my intro, really. Um, I, there is a document that you should already have access to in classroom that covers this structure, and that's basically just what I, I did. Again, his penchant for intellectual discourse is something that I inferred, but also based on my background knowledge about Jefferson, background knowledge helps. And, oh! Here, I, here we go. Let's go a couple minutes later because I have this broken down by like two or three minute increments. Okay, so you want to move chronologically through the text. So you want to show like moving from the beginning of the text to the end of the text as you go through an analysis essay. So my, your topic sentence should be a broad statement about what you're going to address in the part of the text you're getting ready to discuss. So my topic sentence says, Banneker begins his letter to Jefferson, so beginning, um, telling you where I'm in the text, with a paragraph that demonstrates the clear parallels, um, and I should have written the clear parallels between, welcome to the fact that Miss Robinson is not perfect, the British rule over the colonies and slave owners, and slave owners rule over American slaves, to convince Jefferson that political and physical slavery are not all that different. So basically what I'm saying is that he's using what America went through and what the slaves are going through to and like a description of that situation to convince Jefferson that he should see how these are similar situations. And so that's what the rest of my paragraph is going to be about. Now I may describe spe very specific words. I may um, explain 
some very specific rhetorical devices, but here is slightly more broad. Here we go. He uses a synecdoche to cement the parallel, referring to Great Britain's power as, so again, synecdoche is when you use a part to refer to a whole. So the arms and tyranny of the British crown used to reduce you, America, to a state of servitude. By using synecdoche, Banneker reduces the struggle between nations, Great Britain and America, to something more like slavery, the, tr the struggle between individuals. And I give a little bit more explanation of that. I provide a second. So this is my commentary right here, right here, of the quote that I just provided. And then I have a second sentence of commentary that I'm getting ready to show you. Am I ready? Hold on. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, the reader sees an individual in Britain's strong arms. So we think of Britain as one person with arms. And an enslaved individual when he refers to the colonies as you. So we think about the arms as Britain, so like the arms of one person. And we think about America as being like this enslaved person because Banneker refers to the entirety of America as you, as if it's one person, but it's not. Banneker intends here to let Jefferson know that oppression is a pe oppression, whether physical or political. So again, in my concluding sentence here, so this is my concluding sentence because I provided a bunch of smaller pieces of evidence. This is slightly outside the quote sandwich mold. Um, Banneker intends here to let Jefferson know that oppression is oppression, whether physical or political. I'm re-emphasizing here what I meant because America was in physical oppression. Wait. The colonies were in political oppression and American slaves were in physical slavery and oppression. Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay, let's move on to our next body paragraph. <laughs> Clearly I had some like mul multiple mind changes here. Okay, here we go. Later near the middle of the letter, um, that's actually going to be the third paragraph later. In the third paragraph, so it's fine to tell me the paragraph number, Banneker uses a transition to respectfully and subtly point out the absurdity of Jefferson's double standard in regards to freedom. So basically, I'm addressing the idea that um, Jefferson thinks it's really important for the American colonies to be free, but he's still a supporter of slavery, which is why Banneker is writing him this letter, because Jefferson was in a position of power, and Banneker wanted him to change his mind about slavery. After elaborating on America's just, just meaning like right and full of justice, just recognition of the American Revolution as a moment to fight for freedom, Banneker uses but, again, we talked about the structural word, but, to shift the focus towards the injustice of Southern slavery. So it was just a fight for freedom, but we should focus on slavery now. Um, Give you a little bit more text. See, again, I changed a couple things. I, like, removed this because it was too much, and I said later in the third paragraph. Um, here we go. Where do we stop? By using you repeatedly, he groups Jefferson with the slave owners, claiming that Jefferson... So, again, zooming in on a particular word and what you think it means is, is fine claiming that Jefferson and those who agree with him have been guilty of detaining by fraud and violence so numerous of my brethren. Here, Banneker once again uses synecdoche to reduce the fight over slavery to you. So he reduces the idea, like the people who are pro-slavery, to just you. Um, Jefferson and my brethren, um, Banneker and his family, making the fight more personal. Still, he preserves his respect toward Jefferson by repeatedly referring to him as sir. This respect is even more clear when Banneker acknowledges Jefferson's wisdom in the Declaration of Independence, quoting the first lines in order to build Banneker's rapport. And I spelled rapport wrong because I'm not perfect. <laughs> Spelling's hard. Um, in order to build Banneker's rapport, that's the correct way to spell it, with Jefferson. So, again, I, I talk about how he kind of calls Jefferson on the carpet here by saying... Um, but this is unjust and Jefferson and those who agree with him have been guilty of 
detaining by fraud and violence so numerous of my brethren and reducing that to like a conflict between Jefferson and his fam um, Jefferson and Banneker's family. But again, Banneker still builds rapport by quoting Jefferson and talking about how wise his words in the past have been. Then I have my concluding sentence here. Still, Banneker uses this paragraph to emphasize that Jefferson's ideals of equality have not been equally applied to all Americans. So again, I'm going back to that idea of a double standard, but I don't want to repeat myself. And then I acknowledge the fact that I skipped the third body paragraph. Um, and here's my conclusion. Overall, Banneker writes this letter in an attempt to appeal to Jefferson's logical mind. The one logical turning point in Banneker's letter is in reference to the unequally applied principle of freedom that Jefferson had previously espoused. Espouse means to take on as your own. And Banneker drives home the idea that it is morally reprehensible for justice to go unserved and for slaves to go unfreed. So what you're supposed to do in the last paragraph is basically sum up what you said, but in different words so that we don't feel like it's repetitive. I know this is difficult when your brain is tired, but um, the more you get good at analyzing, the easier it is to talk about analysis from multiple angles. So really, this is just a game of practice. So I hope this was helpful. If you have any suggestions as to how to make it more helpful, please send me an email. If you don't know how to email me, uh, you can also comment on this video. Thanks.